Good afternoon. Winter has finally arrived across the country, just in time for you to shake off the snow and settle down to share with us the 42nd Daphabet Masters Final. This event has been going here in the capital city since 1975. Well, this afternoon, Ronnie O'Sullivan is attempting to match the feats of the great Stephen Hendry, trying to win this Masters title for a record equaling sixth time. But for his opponent, Barry Hawkins, he's aiming to make a breakthrough at long last in one of Snooker's three big major events. This has already been a brilliant event over the last eight days or so with memories of maximums that might have been and world record breaking performances and indeed a first ever forfeited frame. It's been quite a week. Of our finalists are Londoners, but no one feels more at home in this event than Ronnie O'Sullivan. This is his 11th final in 22 years, and last night he broke the record for the number of matches played here, 62 and counting. But for Barry Hawkins, strangely, he's never really felt comfortable in this event, and he's been trying for nine years to finally win a match here. Obviously, he's done so to get to this final. It's a huge stage for both men, but of course, they've met on the biggest stage of all the Crucible final in Sheffield. Ronnie draws the crowd and it'll be packed arena again. You can't expect um, 
better occasion than playing Ronnie in a major final. I can't enjoy that occasion and uh, I want to be going home. Probably because of what I've, tournaments I've won and, and that. Compared to Barry, people probably say, you know, he's got more um, experience in them situations. You don't get no easy draws here. They're all, they're all tough games. You get great, great relief if you can manage to beat all the best players in the world. Barry's a great cuist, a great temperament and um, you know a great break builder as well, you know, he's quite efficient amongst the balls. When I played him in the world final the year before I'd played a lot, a lot of snooker, so even though I'd had a long layoff, I still felt I'd had um, a good foundation. Whereas maybe over the last 18 months, two years, I've probably took my eye off the ball. I thought I played really good in that final and um if you can't take confidence from that or a little bit of belief from that, then there's obviously um, something wrong. If you're not firing on all the cylinders, then you have to kind of make up for it with other, other things, and that's part of the, the game is, is having a good temperament. I could find a gear, and if I do find a gear, then I'll be able to apply some sort of pressure to Barry and hopefully you know, have some sort of impact on the game. It'd be fantastic if I can manage to do it, you know, manage to go on and win one especially a big one. Yeah, it's every player's dream, I suppose, apart from winning a World Championship, is to win a Masters title. Well, I think everybody here at Ali Pali is anticipating a great final. It's been a great tournament so far. Perhaps the only concern, Stephen, the head-to-head head -head between the two players points emphatically towards a Ronnie O'Sullivan victory. Yeah, it's not ideal for Barry. Uh, you're playing against someone that you've, you know, I think he's only beaten him once. But hopefully the occasion today is big enough that he can forget all those defeats. And of course, Barry Hawkins, arguably one of the most underrated players. He's been to the final of the World Championship. Somewhere down the line, he's going to convert one of these. Well, you would think so. Uh, obviously, he's unfortunate he came up against Ronnie in the final of the world. He's coming against Ronnie today and the Ronnie O'Sullivan show. So it's going to be a big test for him today. OK, let's talk about Roddy O'Sullivan. Mm. He plays some of the most amazing shots last night. Mm. The whole crowd is in uproar. They're cheering, standing up. He comes in the press room and in the, in the, in the studio and goes, oh, I'm playing rubbish. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's just not going right. I mean, like, I can't hit two balls the same. And what's going on? Is it him talking himself down for a reason? Does that, is that what he feels? Because you wouldn't have come in and said that, would you? you you'd have been going, I'm playing, I'm playing brilliant. Somebody's got to play their brains out to beat me. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think that none of the players pay any attention to what Ronnie says anymore. <laughs> I, I think, I, I think uh, to be honest, I think they get used to it, those sort of interviews. But um, Ronnie, Ronnie will be up for it today. He, he seems to need a, a little bit of a spark to spark him into life. Something like last night, he won a frame needing a snooker. Things like that will get him going. OK, back to Hazel. Absolutely right. If you are a believer in the stats, they point firmly towards O'Sullivan. Nine wins to Hawkins won, as you said, in previous contests, including that 2013 World Championship final and a Crucible semi-final the following year. But those figures don't reflect just how well Hawkins has performed to get into this final, or indeed how much of a struggle Ronnie says he's having with his game right now after taking eight months away from the sport. So what are we going to get from both men? We're about to find out as we get this year's Alphabet Masters final underway. MC Rob Walker, it's over to you. Thanks, Hazel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. It's the big one. Welcome to the final of the 2016 Daffabet Masters. It has been one of the best weeks in the 41-year history of this tournament. And now we get to see a finish with a flourish. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get the boys on the base. <laughs> Please welcome a player who has come of age over the last few seasons. He won his first ranking title in Australia four years ago and hasn't looked back since. Beating Judd Trump to book his place in a maiden Masters final. This is one of the biggest matches of his career so far. So let's hear Ali Pali roar for the eagle-eyed Barry Hawkins. <laughs>
and his opponent, a player who has been thrilling Masters crowds here in London for more than two decades now, bidding for a record equaling sixth title in this tournament. Five times a champion of the world. Blink and you'll miss him. The Rocket, Ronnie O'Sullivan. <laughs> It's best of 19 frames final, played over two sessions. We've got eight frames to play this afternoon and we're going to spend them in the company of two men who are no strangers themselves to Masters finals. Uh, Two-time runner-up Ken Doherty and the 1987 champion Dennis Taylor. Afternoon, guys. A very good afternoon, Hazel. A very good afternoon to everyone. It's cold outside, but it's certainly warm in the Alley Pally and the usual photographs being taken there before the start of a final and what are we in for this afternoon can Barry Hawkins reproduce that form that he did against Judd Trump three centuries and 270 breaks that's what he need to do Ken yeah absolutely Paris with the traditional handshake and I must say Dennis the atmosphere as you said is electric I can't wait for this to start And of course, both lads being from London as well. Got a lot of Thank you, the first frame. Friends and Very family. Hawkins in. To break. Well, what a, an introduction for both players. And that's what they're playing for. Who's going to lift that beautiful water for Crystal trophy tonight? It's an interesting matchup, isn't it, Dennis? You know, played each other, of course, in the world final. Ronnie has a Great record against Barry Hawkins, but I suppose everything goes out the window, doesn't it? Now it's different setting. One. Well, just look at the pace of the table. He just played that gently, and the white still went up past the bulk colours wasn't the best break-off shot from Barry, but look at that white, just kept on rolling. Ronnie O'Sullivan won. need the uh, extension here to get back down the table. He can't get off the reds next to the pink, so pretty straightforward safety shot. Thank you. Good length for the cue ball. what Barry would give to have a start like he had against Judd Trump. Two century breaks in the first two frames. Just got a little glimpse of Steve Peters there, who's been working with Ronnie for a few years. Just two in there, sitting next to Jason Francis, who runs the Legend Snooker. 
that's Steve in the middle there. That was a half chance that uh, Barry let slip there. Didn't risk the pot there, played the safety shot, but he's left one over the pocket and the black's gone over the other pocket. The only problem here is the white will be going towards the red, so he left to be a little bit careful. He could snooker himself on the black, but it's a decent chance here. I'm sure he'll be hitting it with a lot of pace trying to get that cue ball over the left hand side of the table. At the moment, a little bit of a nervy start for Barry Hawkins. Okay, it wasn't that easy when you're tied up against the whole cushion, but I would have expected them to pot it. One. Now the black spot is not covered, and it may pot into the bottom right-hand corner pocket. Interesting to see. It's not the best shot from Ronnie O'Sullivan. He could have come out another... 12 or 18 inches there. Eight. Okay, still on this red, but really wanted to have his hand on the table. Nine. Good recovery. Well, as Hazel was saying at the top of the show, Ronnie, trying to reach six Masters titles to equal Stephen Hendry's six wins. And the greats in the game always seem to start an opening frame so well. The number of times Stephen Hendry 15. made a century break in the opening frame was amazing. They just seem to have a knack of getting off to a quick start. 16. Oh, that was enough. Just a little bit straight on the black. Yeah, they always had a knack of setting their stall out very early, didn't they? Their intentions. Stephen Hendry, Steve, Steve Davis, of course, as well. 23. Thirty-one. Thirty-two. Yeah, he's got an angle, if he wishes. Played for the red in the middle pocket. Wasn't quite a good angle just to nudge the red away that's just above the black to open those two up. Forty. Well, just the wrong side of the blue, so he's got a bit of a problem here. Medium length pot, so not. 45. As easy as it would have been had he have been the correct side of the blue. 45. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 45. 45 break, but you'd be disappointed, Ronnie. He didn't win the frame from that position. Just 
Coming short in the blue there. Curtailed his break. important for Barry Hawkins in this final Dennis particularly to get a good start as we know how good of a front runner Ronnie is it could just steamroll you he gets a couple of frames and so it's important for Barry to set his stall out early in the match and try and put Ronnie under a little bit of pressure and get a couple of frames early on the scoreboard He's just a little bit out at the moment, but uh, he'll settle for that. He didn't <laughs> intend to play there. <laughs> and that's Harris and his son there, who I think was introduced to the crowd beforehand. Rob Walker sometimes brings a couple of youngsters out to uh, emulate what's going to happen a little bit later. And Barry came running out of the practice room to see his son in the arena. <laughs> That was a tremendous shot, wasn't it? I had to swear that around the green. And the pace. Watch him swerve it. Find the angle. And then, of course, the left-hand side takes off the cushion. He was fortunate there because he had to hit that red so thin and he didn't but the other red helped the white to get back down the table no attempt at the pot there <coughs> but the safety's pretty good now if he can get past the green he might be able to snick this red into the right corner. He'd be playing a safety shot, but that's what he'll have at the back of his mind. Just getting a little awkward now, the Reds. And Barry needs him in open play. He's 46 behind. If he gets a chance, there's not many there to score from. Careful here, that red has just come up above the pink spot. Just made things a little bit awkward here, and he doesn't want to knock the black safe here either. That's pretty good from where he was. That's one thing about Barry Hawkins' is safety, Dennis, is top quality. could do with an easy starter just to relax and get a little bit of confidence going but Ronnie's making sure that he's keeping things tight here and protecting that 46 point advantage that's pretty good it keeps on running Oh, another couple of rolls and you have Ronnie snookered on these reds, the left side of the table, just come up a little bit short. <clears throat> How then? Oh, he's knocked the black safe. That's a bonus. The pink safe. But it's the first easy chance 
that Barry's had, but as I mentioned, there wasn't going to be a lot available for him. So if he could get on the blue in such a way, he could then maybe develop the black and a couple of reds. His main thing is just what? to get a few pots and get a bit of confidence going, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. He'll take a couple of these reds with blues before he even contemplates bringing the black into play just yet. Get a get his arm going. Six. He wants to try and cut that deficit. Try and take these loose reds here. Seven. There's a possibility if he gets on this red that's near the right corner pocket in such a way that he's queuing up at it. He was just looking to see, well, maybe I could play a cannon off that and knock the red and black into the open, but it's going to be difficult. Well, let's see how he finishes on this. Yeah, there's a slight chance that he could just well. play a cannon here. Be interesting to see if he does that or whether he concentrates on the blue. Nice play, the cannon, and he's brought the red and the black into play, but he's, he's a bit unlucky. He might be able to cut the brown in, but he's a bit unlucky. He freed the red and the black. Yeah, he could have easily been on that black, couldn't he, into the left centre, and that would have certainly opened up the game, but this Bramble. is still cuttable. Yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Seventy. Yeah, the fact that he was left-handed, of course, made that shot a little bit easier. But if he can put this red and get on the black, he's certainly got a good chance now. It's amazing how, from one shot, Dennis, he almost opened up the whole game. Just bringing that back into play. Well, you could hear a pin drop at the moment in the alley pally. And uh, it has to be said, Barry got a fantastic reception as well from this crowd when he was introduced. He's a very popular player, Barry, and a very, very likable lad. Very laid back. Players all think the world of this uh, young man. Thank you. 26. Yeah, just coming around to have a look. If you can leave the cue ball just above the pink spot, you could possibly pot this red on down the right side and even bring the other one just above it into play. Yeah, nice angle. Well, he's gone a little bit too far. Didn't want to be using the rest here. Well, he can just about reach, but it's a bit awkward bridging over that blue. Nicely on the black as well. He can screw back and get behind this red into the to the opposite left center. It's been a great break so far. Forty-one. Just overscrewed it slightly. He wanted to just roll this in and get on the blue and then get to the yellow because if the yellow doesn't pass the pink for the right corner. He would have had the perfect angle on the blue to bring it into play. Thank you. 
He's got that one red that's near the cushion, which if he gets nicely on it shouldn't be a problem. The problem would be that yellow that's next to the pink. He's going to have to play the snooker now, but he's... Well, you'd have to sort of make him slight favourite well, now. We're 46 points each, and he's got a chance to play a good snooker. Send the red up towards the black and get it in behind the pink. Well, leave it tight on the cushion, but the pink should be the snookering ball. Barry Hawkins, 46. <laughs> yeah, good 46 break, but... Hasn't got the snooker. That was a clever little shot there from Ronnie O'Sullivan. Purposely using the black to keep the white as close to this top cushion as possible. Yeah, all you can do is just hit that and hope that you can get it safe. And, uh, well, Ronnie knocked a long red in against Stuart Bingham last night, which was quite incredible to win the match. So, just a little bit of tension in this opening frame, and there you can see the yellow does pass. The pink, he's just having a good look, is uh, Barry. So if you can pot this, what a chance. It's so important to get that opening frame. It's the best of 19, but it's <laughs> always nice to get the first frame on the board. Yeah. from Ronnie wanted to get that red somewhere closer to this top cushion he has a chance at a pop but the only problem is the cue ball maybe running into the black he's come around to have a look at the angle it's definitely worth having a go at this quite get enough side on that otherwise the white would have stayed near the cushion so another chance at a long pot he's knocked so many long balls in in the last eight days and there's another one <laughs> but does the yellow now go or is the green in the way the green must be in the way he's played to free it but if the yellow doesn't pass the blue, then it's Four. a safety shot. Ronnie 
Oh, that was a beautifully controlled shot. Beautiful touch. Play it that way, dead weight almost. And this looks good, is it? Yellow needs to travel. <coughs> well, one good long pot, and it will secure the frame. It's not an easy one. It's not there. Thank you. Should have already been in the second frame. Ronnie would be thinking he ran out of position when he was on 46. Great shot. Two. Well, he got the main part of the shot, and now he's got to play, hopefully, what he would like to see as a snooker. on the blue to send the green in behind the pink. Easy to escape from, but where are they going to finish up? Ronnie could be in trouble here again. He could just roll the cue ball in behind the blue here. Yeah, plenty of tension out there in this opening frame. And this is another decent chance for Barry. <laughs> Needs to travel a bit further. It's not perfect. Just having to come away from the blue somewhat. Straight on the brown, it would just have been so easy to have clinched the frame. He's got to try and go around the table now. Seven. This is certainly not easy, is it, Dennis? It's a blind pocket. to the cushion for comfort. Just needs the pink. Very well played from Barry Hawkins. Ronnie started with a break of 45 and he got the wrong side of the blue. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have clinched the frame with one visit. Great comeback from Barry Hawkins. He takes the opening frame and he leads 1-0. Well, we thought it was going to be uh, short and brisk at times, but 27 minutes, a very absorbing opening frame, Steve Davis. Yeah, and I think probably Ronnie O'Sullivan would, would have been disappointed to have not converted his first chance. He got to 40 points, uh, came wrong in the blue, and it all sort of came to an abrupt halt, which we're not used to seeing. But it is the first frame, uh, and in a way, this session is the first session they're playing where there's no conclusion, so that puts a different slant on things. It does. Uh, Barry Hawkins started so beautifully and crisply against a Judd Trump with back-to-back -back centuries, but how much does 
that the stealing a frame in effect because he was 45 points behind how much does that give you confidence about the job ahead um, I think it will give him great confidence R Ronnie all week he's not had his cue ball under the control that you would expect normally perhaps the fact that he's not been playing in many tournaments um, his safety sh play looks a bit ragged as well Ronnie so that will give Barry hope um, and the fact that Ronnie was in first as Steve says you're so used to him winning frames in one visit so so when he doesn't convert that that can only give Barry confidence well he talked very favorably about that uh, that world championship final between the two men three years ago in fact he said he would played at the very best in the top of his game he actually made six centuries in that final against Barry uh, and Barry made two himself he played very very well acquitted himself very favorably in that final a few years back didn't yeah, he? yeah and he knows how good Barry Hawkins yeah. is and um, even even though that looked a bit of a scrappy frame there, the way Barry Hawkins finally took his chance shows he's up for it. Uh, and he got, he got the balls out into the open quite nicely. So uh, certainly settled Barry down. And um, you know, mini question for Ronnie O'Sullivan, I suppose. OK, frame two. Must be a fan of Dennis Taylor. Willie Thorne there. Nice glasses. <laughs> oh, that'll do. That just makes the safety shot a little bit more awkward when you're striking over a ball like this and that's why Ronnie didn't even contemplate trying to come back down the table because of that difficult queuing <coughs> foul and a miss <laughs> Ronnie O'Sullivan four. Foul and a miss. It didn't move very far. <laughs> he's trying a, a miss cue there, and he's played it well. You can have fresh air shots at snooker. You can't at golf, but uh, he purposely miscued so that he didn't push the shot. Uh, <coughs> this was the first one he was just trying, and he only—I <laughs> mean, that was a good shot to only move it that far. We could do with a touching ball here just to resolve this. Well, he might be on this red. He's having a good look at it. If he can pot it, he can certainly get on the black. Oh, be careful of that pink. Yes. Oh, it's just over one of them. Excellent shot. Purposely using the pack of reds to hold the cue ball. Is he on this red into this left hand corner pocket? 
but I think the black Eight. is now on the brown spot, so he's got a bit of a problem. <coughs> the spot was occupied. Mm. It goes to the highest available spot. like to get the red away from the black spot area before he takes the black so he may take the yellow and play up for that and now he doesn't mind if he can get himself onto the black Three. doesn't have to play for the black here he can quite easily get on the blue but be interesting to see how he plays it yeah he's gone up for the black Needs to travel Four. a little bit further though. It's coming up a little bit short. It looks to be pretty straight on the black here. It needs plenty of screw back and a bit of side. And there's the screw back and there's a little bit of side. Just gotta be careful here. He's gonna find the gap when potting this red to get back on the black. Well, he's gone up for the blue. I thought it was a bit too risky, but that was beautifully cued and almost effortless. Let's have a look at the action he gets on the cue ball here. That's certainly opened things up now. Seventeen. Where is that cue ball going? Eighteen. This is what happened uh, in the opening frame. He got the wrong side of the blue and then broke down. This is a little bit awkward. <laughs> he cued that beautifully from where the cue ball was, but it's still awkward. The blue back on its spot means that this red to the left feet. corner is going to be very difficult. In fact, he doesn't even want to know about it. He's just playing twice across the table to get in behind the brown. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 23. <laughs> left this red and Barry may be forced into having a go at this the only problem about taking this on the cue ball may be going into the pack of reds around by the pink That's one way of playing that safety shot. Looks very focused today, Ronnie, and maybe that's down to Steve Peters that we showed you earlier. He's probably had a little session with him before the match because he looks pretty relaxed, pretty focused. That's Steve Peters there, the sports psychiatrist, and Damien Hurst just in the front of him there. Good friend of uh, Ronnie's, Damien there, just on the right, smiling away. Huge Ronnie fan. Oh, he 
Jesus. <coughs> made a bit of a mess of that, but it could have been easier than this. A series of little kisses just blocked the easy pot. If this goes to the right middle, it's a better shot to get on the black. No. Yes. Wow. <laughs> But he put it on the right hand jaw there. Great chance now. So that was a bad mistake from Barry. Eight. Nine. Sixteen. Seventeen. Yeah, this is where he makes the game look so easy. Twenty-four. Mm, such a rapid speed. Twenty-five. Average shot time only sixteen seconds. But you're right, Dennis, this certainly he has the look of a, a focused man this afternoon. 32. 33. At times during the match, maybe against Stuart Bingham. Didn't look like he was up for it all the time, but certainly produced some great snooker. And 59 40. ahead, just this red now. Barry will need snookers. Forty-one. He still looks to be queuing beautifully, doesn't he? Yeah, the opening frame, all he did wrong was just got the wrong side of the blue and he made the break of 46. Otherwise, he would have scored enough to win the opening frame. But he's looking good here. Barry just... Uh, 48. Misjudged the safety shot, and it's proven costly. Oh, it's a wonderful little shot. He had to force the angle. He was a little bit straight on that black foot. 55. Force the angle of the cue ball into the reds and develop them. 56. Just look at the way he forces the cue ball there. I'll tell you what, Dennis, the referee, Olivier Martel, he's got his work cut out from this afternoon and this evening. And Ronnie is flying around the table. 70. Well, he won't be too bothered about the red right into the right centre. And Ronnie O'Sullivan gets off the mark. And it's now one frame all. Well, he told us last night, um, it's scary out there. I'm in bits a lot of the time, and I feel a bit embarrassed about my performances. Those were the words of Ronnie O'Sullivan last night. How much calmer does he seem to you this morning, or indeed this afternoon? Is um, yeah, it looks a little bit more, more composed, a little bit more. There's not as much uh, facial expressions from bad shots and things like that. Um, it looks quite calm. They want a nice break at the end there. Again, took him two visits uh, to, to win the frame, which... Um, Obviously, we're, we're not used to when he's at his very best. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, he does look a bit more composed out there today than he did last night. Perhaps Ronnie was expected on current form to have beaten Stuart Bingham last night. Stuart has had a, a pretty rough time in the season, by his own admission. Um, but when you look back early in this championship to that game against Mark Selby, Ronnie absolutely flying at his peak. Does it take a level of opponent who's playing great stuff at the moment to bring that out in him, do you think? I think generally Ronnie O'Sullivan responds very well to adversity. Uh, and sometimes perhaps he has to put it on himself 
which is an interesting thing that he needs to kickstart his enthusiasm uh, by playing in less tournaments, uh, telling himself he's not playing great, that he has to f be fired up. And he was last night, even though he was going, oh, I didn't play very well, he did say he, he had sort of a, a fair bit of resolve. He was digging in. Mm. So I think that's probably what he's going to do today. But every day is a different day. Um, and I think he respects Barry Hawkins as a player. So the day will unfold. Uh, but there might be a time when he, he doesn't sort of, you know, he's not as happy as he is at the currently. OK. Yeah, it's a final as well. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. You, you, you get up for a final, especially the Masters or something like this. Um, and, and I think that will definitely get, get his focus um, today. And he's got a target, of course, Stephen, trying to equal your record of six titles. I wonder how you feel about that today. Um, well, listen, it's not nice. So you want to keep your records, but uh, I think it was inev inevitable that uh, at some point he was going to equal this record. What's in his sights today as we head into frame three? Third frame, Barry Hawkins to break. Yes, Ronnie's uh, nicked quite a few of Stephen Hendry's records. Uh, he's overtaken them in the centuries department. Overtaking them in the maximums department. One. Great opening pot, but uh, he's knocked some terrific long pots in throughout this year's Daffabet Masters. He really has. Yeah, I'm not saying this, this long game is good, to be honest. I think over the years it may have been his Achilles heel, but this oh. week it's been sublime. Five. Well, at the back of the pack goes and one part in this that were released. The one just left it out into the opposite corner. Eleven. Very good, but uh, he's got to pull another long pot out. This will pass the blue. Right in the centre of the pocket. Twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Might have to play a little cannon here. Better if you don't have to, but if you can just uh, nudge the red in the middle there. Certainly has opened things up. Just 34. that one cannon has made quite a difference. He just changed his mind there. Uh, I mean, he did that earlier in the tournament when we seen him jump 42. over the black. Miss Cudi he hadn't quite 46. made his mind up and just played the shot and jumped over the top of the black. That's where you're playing 15. into an area. He's gone too far for the one he wanted, but he, he had a choice of three reds there. So you put the cue ball in an area that 51. sometimes gives you other options.
56. Fifty-seven. It's not too bad. It's got a sixty-four. Couple of reds to go at. Stephen Hendry was talking in the studio about Ronnie O'Sullivan taking a couple of chances to win 65. the frame, but he's certainly up and running now. 71. This is his 11th final. I know he's going for his sixth, but he's been in 11 finals. That's some going. Seventy-eight. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. He hasn't played in a TV tournament since the World Championship, where he lost in that quarter-final back in April. To come back and produce this type of snooker is just uh, <coughs> incredible. 86. First century of the final. Beckons. 87. He's already made a 806 in his career. We've already had 25 94. centuries this week. Record, I think 95. it's 31, Dennis. No. Yep, 2009, Ken. This for the century. <laughs> Absolutely super. One hundred and one. One hundred and two. And we're only six and a half minutes into the frame. It's quite incredible, Dennis. Mm -hmm. And look at this shot here. Watch the side to swing it in between the brown and the yellow. Have a little look at that shot. <laughs> Seventy-one. Can't get to the high break. Judd Trump had a magnificent break of 140 against Neil Robertson in that incredible match that had six centuries and 11 frames. 114. But this is superb. One hundred and eighteen. He's had a one two one already in this tournament. One hundred and twenty three. Supersedes that. One hundred and twenty nine. Absolutely fantastic from Ronnie O'Sullivan. He only needed one chance. And what did he do? He clears the table with that magnificent break of 136, and he leads two frames to one. Well, we talked about winning a frame with one visit. We can't do it any better than make a 136 in Barry. Well, uh, mid-session interval coming up. He could still go there, uh, all square at two each. So, um, you know, it's early, early days, but Ronnie get in there. Ken with a fabulous uh, long pot. Yeah, great. Here's the break off from Barry Hawkins. And he's always. It's that red, isn't it, Dennis? That always pops its head out on the right hand side. And Barry, of course, is trying to get across behind the green. Uh, but once that red pops itself out, it's almost like a shot to nothing. And these days, you're expecting players and particularly of Ronnie's class to, to knock that in a lot of players here would have tucked in behind the green because there's a few reds open but Ronnie decided I'll just knock the long green in and uh, it was the right decision because he won the frame from it yeah but you're still right about Barry Hawkins okay he, he's gonna expect Ronnie to produce some magic there's no doubt about that but he's still only one frame behind as you said big frame coming up 
He's got to stick with Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's got to stick with him all the way through here. Try not Thank you. let him get away. To that will do. Thank lead. you. Fourth frame. Ronnie O'Sullivan to break. Well, whatever you do, don't hit that blue. But at least he hasn't left one. It's turned out okay, I think. Bad misjudgment from Barry Hawkins. Unless that cue ball goes behind Thank the blue, you. which it hasn't done. Normally very proficient in the safety department, but oh well. What? Didn't get enough spin on the ball there. He wanted to bring it out for the black, and he's not on the black. But just look at his focus. You know, he's played a poor shot, but he hasn't bothered about it. He's just getting down and playing. Well, this is tough. That wasn't straightforward. Ronnie O'Sullivan won. It was the first shot, as you said, Kenny, didn't quite get the side, or maybe the white drifted a little touch and finished up hitting the red a little fuller than he intended. I'll just show you that first shot again. He's playing this with left-hand side and uh, hit it sort of full ball. That's why the white didn't come away from the cushion. Looking carefully there. Thank you. One of our top referees now, Olivier Martel well. from Belgium, and he's a pretty good <laughs> moth catcher as well. He works in a hospital in Belgium, so. A little bit of tension on that one. He didn't miss any of these against Judd Trump. And of course. It puts out a pressure on you when you've got Ronnie O'Sullivan coming behind you playing the way he is. But he can't afford to miss too many of those, uh, Barry. Eight. Leave himself low on this black now and putting this red. Nice angle on at the black to go into the reds in his next shot. Nine. And that's what he's done. And he's got to generate a lot of power from this just to spin it through the, the reds. And he's okay. Reds come over to the left center. And not. 16. Get a lot of backspin on it, but he's. Still okay. Listening to Ronnie's interview after the match, he was saying the uh, the pockets here seem to be just playing 22. that little bit more generous than uh, usual. It's only a fraction, but uh, 23. they're so lively, the claws, and that shot, when you play into the bunch, it's amazing how they open up easier on a very fast cloth. It still needs a lot of skill to play the shot correctly, but look how he's got the reds open now. They always seem a lot bigger when you're playing so well, Dennis, as well. It's when you're not playing too well, that's when they look a lot tighter and feel a lot tighter. 31. At the moment, he's making them look like buckets. You can see the referee just wagging his finger, someone probably in the audience with a camera or something. 
And the referee is not only to concentrate on the uh, the match, he's got to keep an eye on what's going on around the table. Um, fabulous crowd again, 2,000 people in Alexandra Palace. It really is magnificent. Have a look at that. 39. He might win it in one visit again here. And uh, the mid-session interval will be coming up after this frame. And you set your stall out in little mini-sessions on long matches, so Ronnie 44. would have been thinking, if I can take this 3-1, 4-0 would be a bonus, but that's the way you look at it. 45. This, well, I talked for a minute. Cue ball was going to run on, and maybe 52. it has. Is he just about on this red? Well, maybe not. That's 52 points ahead. He's playing the double here. Ronnie O'Sullivan, 52. played that double in frustration more than anything else because it wasn't like it was a shot to nothing because he's left this red as we see the double again he's left this red up into the yellow pocket 45. great shot Yeah, not that he's ran out of position many times, but in the earlier frames, if he ran out of position, he just played the uh, Eight. straightforward safety shot. That time, Ronnie risked the double, and he's let Barry back in. It was a cracking Nine. opening red. Very difficult with three awkward reds. But it's a chance that Barry didn't think he was going to get. 16. He won the opening frame after Ronnie had a break of 46. Or 45 it was. But he led 46 nil. 17. Now what sort of an angle? If he has an angle on this black, he can maybe screw back. Well, he can screw back behind the... The red into the right corner. Extend your rest, please. Sure. <coughs> Twenty-four. <coughs> and he's got a little bit of angle on this, and if he can get on the black in such a way, he could cannon the red over the left side of the table out. And he did manage that. So a key shot coming up. He pots the black. He can cannon that red out. It's one of those you keep your eye on the black as well and let the white just take care of itself and hopefully knock the black or knock the red into play. That's the alternate, dropping in behind it, being a left-hander. Yeah, I was just going to say that. You may take that option. You're never really sure when you're trying to take the red out, but certainly dropping behind it, being a left-hander, might be a better option. <laughs> just kind of a little 32. bit too far to reach it, so has to use the rest. Makes this pot a little bit more difficult. Fantastic shot with the rest. And he's got a lovely angle on the black as well now. Well, it's another very tough one he's faced with. 40.
Brilliant. A little bit straight on the black, but it was a cracking pot on the red. And you can see almost dead straight. He would need quite a bit of screw back here. He's just going to leave the longish yellow big shot coming up. 48. Double kiss Thank there. You. He expected himself to get that yellow. It was a fantastic break up till then. Two. And what a frame it would have been to have pinched oh. after Ronnie risked the double when he made that break of 52. Five. Nine points ahead. Ronnie checking the scores. Just brown and blue required. Put that camera away, please. There's someone still with the camera somewhere. Nine. Fourteen. I'm very really disappointed he had a chance. Well, the pink goes in, Ronnie won't bother about the black, and it's another frame on the board. As Ronnie now goes into an interval lead, with three frames to one. Yeah, worrying times for Barry Hawkins because uh, he looked certainly up for it after that first uh, frame, didn't he? But uh, it was the yellow that cost him in the end in that frame, Stephen. It was a fantastic break up to then. It didn't look like a, an opportunity to, to win the frame. He potted two great reds down the cushion with the rest. But these are the shots you have to get in finals. These are the difference between winning and losing as far as I'm concerned. Should he be concerned about the scoreline right now? It is a long best of 19, but even daylight this early? Uh, well, it's just the way it is. Uh, that is snooker. You, you know, on another day, you miss the yellow, it goes safe. Uh, you can't account for how the balls end up, but it's nice if you're going to pockets. You know, with certainly safe in the pocket. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, you know, Steve, I was doing some digging, um, as I do, uh, in terms of career stats and all that sort of stuff, just before we came on air about this final. And I was looking at Barry Hawkins, and would you believe that it was in 2001, the LG Cup. That was the first time that John and Steve and I worked together as a, as a team in the commentary oh, sets, yeah. anyway. And there was a young 21-year-old, Barry Hawkins, made his first breakthrough. He got to the quarterfinals, and that was the first we'd really seen of him. And it's taken him such a long time, really, to, to earn his corner and get through here. But did you spot the nugget, if you pardon the pun, of, of talent that there was even then? Uh, I think it was hard to sort of predict where everybody was going to be in the big mix-up. Uh, the player like Barry Hawkins didn't stand out from the crowd for a long time until he, until he started getting to the final stages of the World Championship. Mm -hmm. Arguably, he looked like one of many very, very good journeymen, and that was something that's aimed at a lot of players. It's very derogatory because we're talking about the best players in the world, but until recently, uh, his stock hasn't risen as a player. OK, well, uh, 15 years later, he's not the, the flashy cumin. Uh, his stock has certainly risen, and I think he's held in great esteem by a lot of the fellow pros. And, and in fact, John Parrott had a quick word with him after he'd beaten Judd Trump in a really, really important semi-final yesterday in which he made three centuries to book his place and that John chatted to him about the magnitude of the achievement of just being here today. So we'll talk about the final in a minute. Let's go right back to the start of it. You're turning up here this week. You've played five times in the Masters. You've never won a match. Hmm. What were you thinking? What were your expectations at the start of the week? Just to win a game. I'd have been over the moon to just win one game. Um, I come up every year. I've drove across on a day, being that it's quite local. I mean, when I say local, it takes an hour. So I've, been, I've drove over every time. And this time, I just thought, no, well, I'll come over the day, day before this time, have a practice on the tables, um, treat it like any other tournament. And um, well, lucky for me, it seemed to have worked. But yeah, no. I, I've, I've played pretty pretty solid all, all the way through so far. Oh, you started off against your pal, didn't you? Because mm. Joe Perry's one of your best mates, isn't he? So that can't yeah. be easy either. No, that was horrible, really. Um, it's not a great draw, and uh, we hang, hang around together all the time on tour, and I have a, have a great laugh. 
and um, if we if we both get beat, we're the first people at the bar really having a few drinks. So um, I spend a lot of time with him. So it weren't it weren't a great draw, but when we was out there, you know, it was just start like like anything. It's business as usual. And, um, yeah, I was pleased. To, I was pleased to win that match because Joe's a great player. Your second match, you got Mark Allen, who'd obviously had a good result against mm. Sean Murphy, who was the defending champion. But your match play was good there, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I think the difference in that game was my safety. My safety was better than his. He, he missed a few. He's up and left me easy chances. Um, Mark, Mark looked like he was playing really well against Sean Murphy. So I knew, I knew I had to keep him, keep him off the table really, because once he gets going, he's hard to stop. He scores heavy, and oh, well, you just don't miss really. So. Um, yeah, I didn't set the world alight, but I played solid match play snooker, if you like, and um, the safety was the difference in that match, definitely. Now, you got to the world final a few years ago, you got Ronnie O'Sullivan in that final, but that must have been magnificent experience for the majors. Oh, you can't, you can't buy that sort of experience, one table set up in the biggest tournament we play, so, yeah, I, can't, I, I thought I played really good in that final, and um, yeah, if you can't take confidence from that, or you, a little bit of belief from that, then there's obviously um, something wrong, but... Yeah, obviously it's a um, great experience and it's, it's stood me in, in good stead over the last year or so. So you've got Ronnie O'Sullivan again in a major final. What's that going to be like? Hopefully he don't play as well as he did against me in the final. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's going to be unbelievable atmosphere. You know, Ronnie draws the crowds and it'd be packed arena again. And um, yeah, you can't, you can't expect um, a better occasion than playing Ronnie in a major final. So uh, yeah, if, I can't, if I can't enjoy that occasion, then... Uh, I want to be going home. <laughs> so it's the Masters final, massive occasion, probably, what you say, first, second biggest in your snookering career. What's yeah. it going to mean to you to be champion? Oh, it mean, it mean everything. Um, yeah, it's only second just beyond the World Championship, really, by, by a small margin, really, in my eyes. And, um, yeah, it'd be, uh, yeah, it'd be fantastic if I can manage to do it, you know, manage to go on and win one, especially a big one. Um, Yes, every 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 player's dream, I suppose, apart from winning the world championship, is to to win a masters title. So, uh, yeah, I'll be trying my best, that's for sure. And you also know that if you've won here, you've beat the best, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. You don't you don't get no easy draws here. They're all they're all tough games, and you can see that by the standard this week. It's been, I think, it's been unbelievable, really. And um, yeah, you get great great belief if you can manage to beat all the best players in the world and, and lift the lift the trophy. Wish you all the best, Barry. Cheers, cheers, John. And I guess like Stuart Bingham, the question is, does, does he need a major title to underscore the talent that he has and to, to actually validate the work that he's put in over the last 15, 20 years? Um, he's, he's going to have to win tournaments like this to be recognised um, as a top, top player. At the moment, you're never going to, when you talk about winners of the big events, you're never going to put Barry as one of the potential winners. And that's no disrespect to him, but he's just not one like the Robertson, Selby, or Sullivan. He's never going to be in there until he wins things like this. OK, well, he's already won the Players' Championship and he's also won the Australian Open. And that was his big breakthrough a couple of years back. But again, same, same sort of thing. Does he deserve to win a major title, given his record over the last few years? Oh, I don't think anybody... <laughs> no, no, nobody deserves. <laughs> I don't think anybody deserves to, to win. To win. Yeah. But, uh, if you were looking at perhaps application, uh, then arguably, you know, perhaps more so than others. I don't know, he's practicing routines. Um, there's plenty of people in, in life that work really, really hard and get nothing for it. Uh, and in the end, one of the fascinations of sport is the, is the types of different types of animals that come to the table. Some seem to make it look so easy. Some have to graft their way, way through. I think what would happen is if Barry Hawkins won a big one, his family, friends, everybody around him, uh, loved ones, would, would, would all say the same thing. He thoroughly enjoyed it because he put everything into yeah. it. And that's all you can ask of yourself. A bit like Stuart Bingham. Yes. Because it was exactly the same scenario with him. He'd been there, he was the journeyman, to use that horrible expression, but suddenly it all came together and everyone said, you know something, he was a champion in waiting all along. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anyone. I mean, I think I, I didn't tip him all the, all the, all the last three matches in <laughs> Sheffield. And, and, and again, I, I still don't tip Stuart against the top, top players, who I believe are the top. <coughs> so it's, yeah, I mean, it's to their credit um, and it's that, that what, what they've achieved in the game. But you've, you've got to become, to be known as a top, top, you've got to win these events, you know, to win them first of all, but repeatedly win them. And then people thought, say, you are one of the, the top players in every, every event. Well, for Barry, actually, he's run into Ronnie O'Sullivan in a similar situation that he did the last time that they met in that World Championship 
Championship final. As you'll probably know, Ronnie's taken an eight-month sabbatical away from the game. Not the first time he's done it, of course. And in fact, in 2013, he'd practically taken the whole year off and turned up at the Crucible to defend successfully his world title. And who did he beat? Barry Hawkins, but he doesn't have to make things difficult for himself, jumping in the deep end once again in one of the major events, and Steve chatted to him after he got through to his 11th Masters final last night. Ron, even though you got over the line relatively easily, it was a struggle out there for you, wasn't it? In the post match interviews, you were sort of saying, struggling to get on the shots right with your back. Mm. Yeah, just struggling to get on line and get the cue on the chest and you know, just, you know, when you're playing, normally the cue and the body just feel like a unit, you know, and at the moment they're not working as a unit, so I'm having to fight it out there, you know, and, uh, but sometimes you have to do that, so, and that's what I've done. You're not the type of person that just turns up to make the numbers up, never been the case, so this is the first tournament of the season for you, <laughs> uh, you've come here to win, and it must have been a, a tough challenge knowing that your back wasn't absolutely perfect. Yeah, but like like I say, you know, I was in the tournament and I decided to enter and uh, so you, you know I'm here now, you know, and um, so I have to try and forget about all that stuff about not feeling right in the shot and just kind of you know go with what I've got and 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 hopefully find a, some spells or moments where you know I can I can produce some decent snooker to to give me half a chance. You were made to fight hard in your first match against Mark Williams. That was a mm. tough opener. Yeah, well, Mark's always going to make it tough. You know, he's. Um, Although he's a brilliant player, he's got that um, ability to just um, be dogged and fight hard, you know. And uh, probably one of the best match players we've we've ever had. So, yeah, it was a it was a, a nice match to play because we we know each other's game really well. So, um, you know, I was fortunate to get over the line in the end. In your second match against Mark Selby, did you expect more of him? In the in the in the build up, you're talking it as if you were going to expect. You always expect a, a tough match with Mark, but if he scores well. Um, you know, he he win most of the matches he plays because tactically and his temperament wise, there is no one better in the game. Um, but he just wasn't scoring as much as he'd probably like to have done. But if he does score, then you know he, he he's probably the favourite to win any tournament that he plays in, really. Um, but luckily for me, he didn't really fire, and I played probably my best game of the tournament against Mark. The last time you had a big layoff. Mm. The play you played in the final was Barry Hawkins. Mm. You've had a fair layoff this time, and once again, Barry Hawkins. Yeah, yeah. You know, Barry's been probably the best player of the tournament, along with maybe Judd Trump, uh, really for, for for the standard that they've produced match after match. And uh, Barry's a great cueist, a great temperament, and um, you know, a great break builder as well. You know, he's quite efficient amongst the balls. Never seems to move the white ball that far, so he's always someone. You know, as a snooker player, you like to watch some of that, you know. But I think when I played him in the world final, the year before I'd played a lot, a lot of snooker, so even though I'd had a long layoff, I still felt I'd had um, a good foundation um, from, from all the matches that I'd played from the previous year. Whereas maybe over the last 18 months, two years, I've probably took my eye off the ball and, and haven't probably played anywhere near as much as I should have done, really. And I think maybe that's as well part of why my game is not as strong as it probably was two or three years ago. You're obviously the favourite coming to the match. In your own eyes, the, you're, you're experienced enough to be able to take that on your shoulders? Yeah, I don't get phased by you know me being the favourite. I know... I know um, probably because of what I've tournaments I've won and, and that compared to Barry people probably say you know he's got more um, experience in them situations but you know if Barry plays how he did today and I play how I did tonight then I know who I would want to be on <laughs> you know I know his corner I'd like to be in but I'm not going to discount myself you know because I know that you know I could find a gear and if I do find a gear then I'll be able to apply some sort of pressure to Barry and hopefully you know have some sort of impact on the game. And just uh, to allay the fears for Ronnie O'Sullivan fans, your back, it's not in pain, it's not like two mm. sessions you're going to struggle by the end of it, it's more just a, a stranger feeling, it's not something that could go at any moment in sort of second session. No, no, not at all, you know, that, um, I've gone past that phase, it's just about just start, starting to f feel, starting to know your own body, you know, and at the moment I don't, I can't feel where my knee, my back, my arm, my, you know, I can't feel... I feel very uncoordinated, really, so I feel a lot quite off-balanced. Every now and again, I feel OK, and then I'm like, OK, I'll just, 
you know that that's, it's not too bad then but um there were spells out there when i played stuart in the semi-finals where you know it, it was a real struggle well good luck tomorrow thank you i'm gonna need it <laughs> Yeah, 11th final for Ronnie, going for a sixth record, equaling sixth Masters title. And uh, a man who's been in Ronnie's corner as part of his team, really, I suppose, over the last few years is Turner Prize winning artist Damien Hurst. Lovely to see you, Damien. Yeah, good and to see you. And I know you've been up in the, the dressing room having a chat with him, along with Dr Steve Peters. How's he doing? You never know. It's a mystery, isn't it? But he's, uh, I mean, he's, you know, he's up and down. It's like when he's winning, he thinks he's losing. So, But I was, I was happy today in the practice when Steve Peters turned up. But, you, do, you know, he's, 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 he's doing good, isn't he? 3-1? Yeah, absolutely. It looks like he's, he seems a lot more settled than he did last night because when he came in the studio last night, he was saying that he just was not feeling good about his game. Do you know some of the underlying reasons for that? Is it a mystery to you as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, I think he's, what goes on in his head is not what goes on out there, so it's, it's really difficult, but I think... You know, I mean, he's, he, he watches it back afterwards sometimes and goes, oh, actually, I played pretty good. When he's, when he, in his mind, he thinks he's playing terrible. But, I mean, I can never work that out. It makes me laugh. But, you know, I've been coming so many times with him. It's like I, give, I tried to kind of give him some constructive criticism today, and I was like, I just thought, I don't even know why I'm bothering. <laughs> <laughs> You've been a friend of his for a long time. What attracted you to, to Ronnie and also the game of snooker, and, and how much of a part does snooker play in your own work? I mean, I love snooker. I, just, I love the uh, the way that it's like sort of like men trying to be machines or something. It's like you know you've got because it seems impossible. It's like and it's all about that hu you know that human element which kind of like won't let you do it. But it, I, I, I mean, it's you know it's, it's always been. I mean, it's always amazed me since I was a kid. I, I remember watching it on black and white TV. Long oh, time I've ago. Been there. <laughs> I remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember both of you guys. <laughs> Vaguely, yeah, yeah. Actually, there was something you wrote, or actually you were quoted, Damien. You said, Ronnie's not the mercurial flawed genius of the past anymore. He never gets trapped in a, in a cage in a match. He's like a free bird. When the hell did I say that? Uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> Hector, actually, Hector Nunn. Wow, I can't do, remember saying do you, that. Do you believe that? Do you, do you, is he a completely different type of player than everybody else? Yeah, I think he is, because I think it's instinct, but he's like, you know, but he's still, you know, he can still, you know, analyse it. I mean, we watch Trump. Trump's got a similar type of instinct, hasn't he? But he seems he seems to get a bit more. Um, he doesn't seem to know where he is sometimes. Sometimes uh, it's the only player, I, and pra perhaps Stephen as well, that I thought I'd love to be able to see through their eyes to see if they're seeing different pictures to the ones that the normal mortals of the game have seen. Now, do you think he's got something you know, that's an extra special level of imagination or? He's getting different signals. Uh, it's something you. Yeah, I mean, it must be. I mean, it's like I mean, when you watch him, I can, you know, I mean, it can definitely, you know, it's almost like being a little bit. Um, well, you know, like when you look at the table, he can sort of see the shape of it in a way, rather than see what parts, of, you know, what parts to do or whatever. So it's, it's not, he's not analytical. He doesn't take it apart. But then you're a bit like that as well. In the artistic really. world, you sort of get people that are like that, and you seem to be able to sort of get something that other people can't see. The closest word I can think of is instinct, really. I mean, I think, you know, but when, you know, like that red that Ronnie did yesterday, the long one, yeah, to the yeah. corner pocket, yeah, I was just yeah. like, oh, no, he's like, why would you even go for it? And like, but, you know, to not miss it is like so insane. Do you, do you talk about Stuka when you're in the dressing room? Yeah, and I had a little chat with him. I said, you just got 137. He's like, yeah, it felt like 337. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring this up, Damien, because last night, you know, he was saying it's almost like you can't live with snooker and can't live without it. And, you know, when you were coming towards the tail end of your career, you'd, you'd cease to be winning like a machine mm. anymore. But had you still been able to win, but not with as much style, would that have been enough? Because it doesn't seem to be enough for Ronnie. Um, yeah, I mean, winning was everything for me. That, that was enjoyment. I used to say to Steve, why are you still playing? He says, I'll just, I'll just go there and see what happens. I enjoy playing. But I says, they take away the winning, you take away the enjoyment from me. Um, so so that, that was a big part of it. But I was, I, was, I was very similar to Ronnie, so critical of my own performance. It's almost like a quest for perfection. Do you, do you identify with that as an artist, this perfectionist instinct? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, so a lot of people come up to me and they say, oh, you must love this with these big tanks and all the machines and all the people and building the show and, you know, three weeks before you've got people in tanks and suits. And I go, I hate it. I just like the opening when it's all finished and it looks perfect. <laughs> Does it look good to you for a sixth title today? 3-1 makes me feel good. <laughs> Are you just as nervous? That's you get nervous say. watching this, yeah? Well, I don't know. It's, you can't get nervous because you just don't know what's going to happen. Well, yeah, it's so difficult. Damien, you better get back to your seat. Thank you so much Thank for popping. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Another four <coughs> things to play this afternoon, and uh, we welcome John Parrott and John Virgo for those afternoons.